Welcome to Trading Secrets, education and small business mixed with a bit of zesty Brazilian sauce. Here's your host, Roger. Welcome to Trading Secrets. This is the introductory show, or I guess we should call it 000. Basically, this episode is to introduce who I am and why I've decided to create the show. Also, we should go over the format, duration, and frequency. Obviously, the only consistency here is change. And upon your feedback, we may keep things as it is or improve upon it. But first, let's address the accent, which I'm sure you have noticed. So it's called a Bostonian accent. It's a mix of Brazilian accent and a Bostonian accent. Here in Boston, people speak slightly different than the rest of the country. We say things like lobster, park the car next to bar, that kind of stuff. So please be kind because that is not going to change. Anyway, who am I? My birth name is Rogério Magalhães. I am from Brazil, but here in America, Rogério became Roger. And the Magalhães is obviously something that nobody can get it. Nobody understands it. It spells M-A-G-A-L-H-A-E-S. But in English, there is no such a thing as a L-H. So I get it. So people start calling me Mahalis, Magahalis, Mahalanis. Eventually, it became Megalis. So from now on, I am Roger Megalis. The funny thing is, my Brazilian friends that I met here know me as Roger. And my Brazilian friends that I had before coming to America call me Rogério. So it's kind of a mixed bag when I go to Brazil and I need to answer two different names at the same time. Now that the name is out of the way. Oh, and by the way, having an odd name like I have is like having a signature that you cannot forge. So when people misspell my name writing a check, I have no problem bringing it to the bank because everybody knows it's me. I don't even need to show an ID. So there's an upside having a weird name like that. Now you know that I'm from Brazil, from the state of Sao Paulo, which has the capital also called Sao Paulo. So I'm from Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo, Brazil. I'm the big brother and only have one sister, Carolina, but everybody calls her Carol. I am married to Ana. She's also from Brazil, but we met here. We don't have kids, but we have a lot of things in common. We love to travel. We love to try new food. We like to camp. And she also supports my workaholic lifestyle. So it's very important to have someone that understands your lifestyle, especially when you are an entrepreneur and needs to get things done no matter what. I guess I was born as an entrepreneur because my first memory as a kid, I remember going around the neighborhood when a shiny shoe box on the back asking for the neighbors to shine shoe their husband's shoes. I called my father one day and asked him to ask his friends to build me a shiny shoe box. I guess I always wanted to have my own money. So I work as a kid just a bit. Then I went to school. And at age of 14, I went to vocational school, trade school. And then I learned a profession. From that point on, I went to manufacturing and worked there. And I went to school at night. And then at age 19, I went back to a vocational school again to take another training, which was called robotics. It was a kind of a new trend, which I learned mechanics and electronics at the same time. Upon completing that course, I went to work for other manufacturing facilities, which I worked until 26 before coming to America. Here in the U.S., my first job was washing cars. 
Ironically, I never like washing my own cars. Imagine doing that for a living. So I didn't really like it. I didn't really enjoy it. And after the first week, I got my paycheck of $220. And I say, man, this is not enough. So I have a lot of dreams here. I want to build the whole life here. So this amount, not going to cut it. So I worked there for another three or four weeks, but I was looking for alternatives. One day, I was looking at the paper, and I saw a lot of positions for truck drivers. And I said, wow, that must be nice. So I can drive a truck, which was something I always wanted since I was a kid. And I can travel across the country for free and make good money at the same time. So I don't see a downside. I went to the registry and applied to get my CDL license test. That was only one problem. I didn't speak a good English back then. They had an option to take the test in Spanish, which I did. Not that I knew Spanish, but Portuguese and Spanish is somewhat similar. So I took my chances. And eventually, I got my license. Now, I have my CDL license, but I have no experience. I applied to a lot of companies, but nobody really wanted to handle you a big semi-truck without much experience. I kept trying until I found this company that basically was a convenience store chain with over 800 stores in a big warehouse distribution center that our job would be to drive the trucks to a few stores at a time. And in each store, we unload by hand a portion of groceries and byproducts and such a thing. So each load would be probably 10 to 12 stores which will fill a whole trailer. By the end of a 12-hour shift, I was pretty much dead, just ready to sleep. I did that for a while as a helper, just coming, watching, and helping. And then on the Fridays, I would call my boss and say, hey, can I practice in the yard? I just need to get some experience driving the truck. He agreed on that. And after six weeks, there was an opportunity to take a route in upstate New York as a driver was leaving. So they call me and I say, yep, I'm up for it. But remember, back then there was no GPS and I still didn't have a good English. So the only way I could do 44 stores in 800 miles on an overnight shift was by reading directions. They had directions at the office. But remember, I didn't speak a good English. I didn't understand quite well. So I said, yeah, I'll take the route, but I'll go as a helper for one week so I can just learn the way. What I did, I just sat on the passenger side and I wrote the entire route in Portuguese. By the end of the week, we came back to my boss and he said, are you ready to go by yourself next week? And I said, yep. And then he gave me that look and I said, what do you mean? I said, yeah, I'm ready to go. He said, do you know the route? And I said, yep. How do you know the route? And then I show him the paperwork in Portuguese. He said, what is that? He said, I wrote the directions in Portuguese so I can do it. And he gave me that look. It's like, well, I guess this guy is up for something. So I took my route. And from that point on, I was always looking to get a better route and do the extra work. And then as the better routes were freeing up, my boss would call me and ask if I want to take them on. And I was just getting better and improving and to a point that I said, Manny, I want to be a vacation driver. And a vacation driver is good and bad at the same time. We had a fixed salary. It was the highest pay in the company. But pretty much you are on call. 
you can go to absolutely any route, anytime, anywhere. So there was a trade-off. I like that because it was very challenging. I would not know where I would go. I would not know how to park in certain stores and that kind of stuff. And I always liked the challenges. So after four years doing this, I had to save a good chunk of money. And then I decided to buy my own house. So I called the agent and asked her to set up a time to visit a listing that I saw on the internet. When I got to the house, the house didn't look like exactly the one I saw on the listing. And I said, is this Holliston? And she said, no, this is Hoppington. And so interesting, I guess you made a, you made a mistake because I was looking for a house in Holliston. But I kind of like this one and I want to put an offer on it. And the offer was accepted and I ended up getting that house, which is the house that I still live in, in right now in Hoppington, Massachusetts, which happens to be the starting line of the Boston Marathon. So I see things as they happen for a reason. That's basically, I never complain when things don't go my way just because I think there's someone always looking out for me. So I got this condo and then need some work, which I was doing over the weekends and on my free time. And I replaced floors, painting, pretty much did everything myself. And I really liked the idea of the hands-on and dealing with tools and all. But when the remodeling was done, I was missing the hands-on part of it. And one day I was talking to my cousin and his phone was ringing off the hook. And I say, man, what are you doing? Your phone doesn't stop ringing. He said, I'm installing blinds and shades. And I look at him like, what? Who the heck's going to pay you to install blinds? Because I did all the work at my house myself. And I say, this is such an easy thing. Anyone can do it. And he said, well, some people know how to do it, but they are too busy. And some people are not handy at all. And I say, really? Is that an opportunity here for this? He said, yep, I've been doing quite a while doing that. And I say, can I work with you one day? I just want to check things out and see how it goes. And that was how I really got into the window treatment business. I really liked it. And because I have a mechanical mind, I thought it was somewhat easy. Obviously, I had no clue what I was about to get into it. So I said, can you hook me up with your company? He was a subcontractor. And he brought me over to the manager at his store. And I say, hey, how are you? I like what you guys do here. Are you hiring? And she said, yeah, we are always looking for extra hands. And I said, I'm a little handy, but I have a full-time job as a truck driver. I'm not looking for a full-time position here, but if you have something on the side, I'll be happy to. And she said, yep. So the way this company worked, they would put your card on a counter. And then as people would have come, they would offer two or three cards and have the people call. So I was basically driving trucks four days a week and installing blinds and shades for another two. I was quite busy between the two, really enjoying. My phone was ringing quite well. And then after two months, it really stopped completely. I thought it was odd. And I went back to the store and then uh, I didn't see my cards on the counter. I asked the girl, the sales girl. And I say, where's my cards? She said, oh, you need to talk to the manager. I said, well, it doesn't sound good. So I went to the back and I say, hey, so-and-so, what is my cards? I don't see my cards on the counter. I said, yeah, Roger, we need to talk. I say, what's going on? She said, well, all the other installers, I'm not getting much work because everybody wants to work with you. And as you being the newest guy here without much experience, 
they said they are going to leave if I don't fire you. And I say, are you for real? Your clients are all happy. I'm doing a good job, no complaints. And you rather keep the guys, they are not willing to really go the extra mile in exchange for me. They are keeping your clients happy. You know what? If that's the way you want to do it, that's totally fine with me. So I was fired for doing a good job, which is kind of ironic. So I got home that day, kind of sad, and my wife was, what's going on? And say, I was fired. Say, what did you do? And I say, I guess I was doing a good job. That's why they fired me. And she said, why don't you go to another store? I say, no, never mind. I'm just going to let go. I'm just going to stick to the truck. And she said, no, you really like these. Why don't you go to all these stores? So I went and then more high-end stores. And I came and I said, you know, I have a kind of two months of experience installing shades, that kind of stuff. And she said, are you a certified installer? I say, certified installer? What the heck is that? And she said, well, you need to be at least a Hunter Douglas certified installer for us to hire you. And I said, wow, I not even knew such a thing exists. So I went back home and I started searching for trainings. And then I found training all over the country, but near my area. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to wait until these people come around. And I, I call my boss and I say, I need some vacation. So I got my few days off and I went to get training in Minnesota. Then I went to the CHF Academy in North Carolina. Back then, they had a, a school in Charlotte. And I took classes there with Beth Hodges. And I learned as much as I could. So after that, I got back home and I applied to work for Lowe's as a subcontractor installing shades and blinds. And that's basically how Shades in Place started. Once in a while, I would get a call for someone looking for shades to buy shades directly from me. And I saw an opportunity there. And that's how I became a dealer as well. And every time I got a chance to go to a training from a manufacturer, like seminars, that kind of stuff, I went. I even became a joke at my friend's John Freak's classes. He used to work for Sonfi, and every season they would have come to the Boston area, and I would sign up to the class. And then once I get to the class, he said, you're here again? And I say, yeah, John, every time I come here, I learn something. And I became the joke. So I took as much training as I could, even repeat trainings, because every time you do something for the second time, you learn something else. I also did a lot of networking groups like BNIs, Chamber of Commerce, that kind of stuff. And my name really started cutting around. So after that, Facebook came around, and then all those private groups and specific groups and start sharing information and learning from each other and meeting these people at trainings and classes and start becoming friends with some of them. I even created my own Facebook group called Free Speech Window Covering Pros, then I start doing a newsletter for my clients, and apparently the the name got around. And as I would go to those trainings and seminars and that kind of stuff, and make friends with those big shots in the industry, I would add them to my email newsletter, and eventually I start getting invitations to write articles and pieces on installation subjects. Currently, I am a columnist for Window Fashion Vision magazine. I am the installation instructor for WFCP Fast Track Installation Program, and I am also a board member with WCAA, which is the 
Window Covering Association of America. In September of last year, I created a second company called Trading Up Consulting. And that was after I received several requests over the years, such as, where do I find good installers, Roger? Is there a school for installers? That kind of stuff. Because we know there's not enough installers in our industry. So the goal here is to create classes in all areas, such as hard treatments, soft treatments, shutters, motorization, to provide basic training for people so they can start off on the right foot. Obviously, the online training is not going to be enough. Everybody knows that what we do is very hands-on. It requires a lot of training on the field. And you need to feel it. You need to see it. You got to go up on the ladder. But at least having some online classes, we can save a lot of time, a lot of aggravation, a lot of frustration by cutting the learning curve with someone else's experiences. So that's what I'm uh, hoping to do. That's my goal with Trading Up Consulting. And also, we know our industry have a very aging installer's workforce. And a lot of these guys are retiring. The kind of work we do is very hard on our body, and we can only take these for so long. So when young kids go to trade schools, they are looking for to become a electrician, a plumber, uh, HVAC kind of guy. They have no idea they can become a window treatment installer just because there is no school for that. So nobody ever going to think, oh, I want to grow up to become an installer unless you are born in the family business and you understand this is a good making money is a good earning living that you can make being an installer. So my hope is to open opportunities to a lot of people, to a lot of young professionals, so they can start their own career or expand other businesses as well. So in a nutshell, that is about my whole life in 20 minutes or so. To conclude, my initial idea with the podcast is to release a new episode every two weeks. Average length should be 15, 20, 25 minutes. I think this first episode it will be the longest episode we're going to do it just because I took my time to explain what I'm coming from and all my background. So uh, the same way I treat my clients, I'm treating everyone that listen to my podcast. I really appreciate the support. I thank you again for sticking around to the very end. I really, really welcome your feedback, your suggestions. I wanted to make this something that you really would looking forward to listen. And I want to create a friendship. I want to create this whole community. So I welcome your feedbacks. I welcome your questions. If you have questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them on my next episode. I even create a special email address for the show. It's podcast at trading up consulting. Podcast at trading up consulting. And I cannot wait to hear from you. So thanks again. And remember to keep living the dream. Until next time. Thanks for listening to today's show. Please send us your comments and suggestions to improve your overall experience. Also, make sure to subscribe to our Trading Secrets newsletter via www.tradingupconsulting.com and tell your friends either by word of mouth or via Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Until next time.